started. A very good evening to those in India and the East. Good afternoon to Europe and good morning to those tuning in from the United States. My name is Rudra Chaudhary. I'm the director of Carnegie India. It gives me great pleasure in welcoming you to the third in a series of webinars on and around COVID-19. We at Carnegie India are committed to bring to you top line analysis based on deep and collaborative research, especially in this time of a complex health emergency. The pandemic has deepened the fault lines across issues around globalization, international cooperation, the future of work, the import of technology, the balance between privacy and contact tracing, the role of the international and the rise of the national. These are only some of the areas of interest that our scholars and research teams investigate and explore. Our work on COVID-19 is organized in a dedicated webpage accessible through our website, carnegieindia.org. Today's webinar is titled Surveillance in the Age of Contact Tracing. The debate on the balance between privacy and economic growth is one that has shadowed the growth of technology and regulation for many years. In India, a privacy bill, which at the moment is with a joint parliamentary committee, will partially determine how such balances are to be managed in the future. In the age of contact tracing, these debates have turned sharper. The use of health applications to trace those affected by COVID-19 play a key role, no doubt, to contain the spread of the virus. Yet, and as countries around the world develop new such applications, often asking for personal data and accessing lo location information, there is a growing call for assessing how, even in times of an emergency such as this, an individual's personal data can in fact remain protected. In China, the Alipay Health Code is now mandatory for its citizens. Early assessments make clear that privacy concerns are hardly of paramount importance. In Singapore, the app traced together is not mandatory. It uses an open source code that can be audited. In India, the application Arogya Setu, a government application for contact tracing has been rolled out. Some argue that this application will be a crucial weapon in the fight against COVID-19. Others, however, highlight concerns around protecting individual privacy and question whether this application is in fact able to balance the needs of privacy with the function it has been designed to fulfill in these extraordinary times. To examine these questions and fault lines and to give us a clearer picture of how such tools have been used in the past, what really are the challenges in the present and the extent to which the experiment with privacy ought to be more fairly balanced against the need of the hour. We're joined by a very special set of speakers Anne Liu, Raoul Martin, and Anirudh Berman. Anne Liu is a senior technical advisor at the Clinton Health Access Initiative, where she focuses on developing, implementing, and monitoring a suite of digital solutions to enhance surveillance capabilities. Anne is also a lecturer at the School of International and Public Affairs, or SIPA, at Columbia University. She co-teaches a course on global health, and current work focuses on digital solutions for disease surveillance including childhood illness, malaria, and Ebola. Anne oversaw the deployment of mobile tools in Guinea during the time of the Ebola outbreak in 2014. She has a master's from John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, another master's from, in biomedical sciences from Tufts, and a bachelor's in biology at MIT. Raoul Martin is a founding partner at Trilegal. He now serves on the board of Trilegal after many years on the firm's management committee. Raul has advised on some of the largest DMT transactions in the country. He has worked with companies across all sectors of the industry, from big telecom operators to ISPs, OSPs, and managed data service providers. Raul is one of India's best known, best read technology lawyers. Pertinently for this discussion, Raul advised the Indian government on the design of Arokya Setu, the health app that leverages data science for the needs of contact tracing. He is a published author, he writes a weekly column on the interface of law and technology entitled Ex McKenna in Mint, a leading national business daily in India. 
And perhaps most importantly, Raul hosts the hugely popular podcast, also named Ex Machina, on how changes in technology shape society. Anirudh Berman is an associate fellow at Carnegie India. He works on key issues relating to public institutions, public administration, and the administrative and regulatory state. He has also worked extensively on financial regulation and regulatory governance. Importantly, from the perspective of this webinar, Anirudh has spent a lot of time on the balance between economic growth and privacy. He has published what is perhaps the deepest interrogation of India's current privacy bill. Prior to joining Carnegie India, Anirudh worked with the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy, the Center for Policy Research, the Parliamentary Research Service, the law firm Amarchand Mangaldas, and he graduated from Harvard in 2002. Before I turn to our very special guest, two housekeeping points. We have over 250 people who've registered for this webinar. Many of you are on Zoom. Some of you are hearing or watching this on YouTube live from different parts of the world. For those on Zoom, could I please ask you to enter your questions at any point in the discussion in the Q&A tab that you'll see in the bottom center of your page. For those on YouTube, not to worry, please add your questions. They will be relayed to me in real time and I will bring them back to the panel. With that, could I please turn to Anirudh for his opening remarks and to perhaps help frame the debate as it were for discussion today. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. And uh, what I'm going to do is to basically take uh, some time just to frame the big issues that we should be thinking about in this context of contact tracing uh, while this pandemic is raging around the world. So the big question is why should we actually worry about contact tracing? Uh, this is a global health emergency uh, and a lot of the work to actually combat the pandemic depends on how well you're able to trace the spread of the transmission. Uh, other pandemics like Ebola have also required fairly extensive contact tracing. Uh, I think one of the distinguishing features in this particular case is the absence of a vaccine, which really raises the stakes, and also the very high speed of transmission across uh, individuals and communities. So contact tracing becomes much more intense. The stakes are higher. States have to take a much more proactive approach than past pandemics. And what we are seeing is that existing technology is really helping governments try different methods to do better contact tracing. So people are using smartphones, uh, internet, data, uh, all the major uh, technological tools that are available to people right now. Uh, this is being used to do fairly, uh, some would argue accurate and precise location tracking. There are other data uh, sets being utilized. South Korea, for example, looked at credit card histories of people to see where uh, they had been, who they had come into contact with. Uh, apps like uh, Aroge Setu and others are also looking at body temperatures of not just the smartphone user, but also other people they've come into contact with. So uh, you're using a lot of existing information in a far more intrusive way, far more intense way to try and uh, look at, to try and trace the transmission of this virus. So why is this worrying? I think one is, yes, there is a, uh, every day smaller creep of government uh, power in how it's deploying technology to actually look at individual behavior. Uh, and that has some kind of a threat for individual privacy and autonomy. I think the larger question is also about whether this in the long run or even in the medium run, uh, term can lead to what you would call big government, which is it's a substantial increase in the size and power of government. It's not just something that happens on a slow, gradual day-to-day -day basis. And uh, I think the history of the 20th century, World War I, World War II, Great Depression, 9-11, uh, in all of these big emergencies, we've seen that governments have actually increased the scope of their power fairly significantly. So one of the big issues that we need to worry about here is whether this particular pandemic is going to actually create what I'm calling big government here. And we have a recent, relatively recent parallel from 9-11 where the, uh, the 
attack itself, it created a justification for creating a new kind of surveillance state. The Patriot Act was passed. It changed the relationship between American citizens and the state. Uh, new agencies were created and the actual scope of surveillance was only revealed when, uh, when Edward Snowden actually uh, revealed the information about the NSA's activities. Another example is the war resolution that uh, the US Congress passed in 2001 after the 9-11 attacks. And that war resolution has still not been uh, undone. So it continues to be in effect. So these are examples of how emergencies like this pandemic can create a, a good legitimate ground for increasing the size and scope of government. And I think that is the larger worry when we are thinking about what kind of surveillance activities are being conducted right now. Uh, the worry is that not just that does it mean something in addition to what the government was doing yesterday or before the pandemic, but will this actually create grounds for uh, the government arguing for creating a new kind of surveillance state or new or asking for new kinds of surveillance powers? I think that's the bigger worry. So how do you try and measure whether there is an actual big government being created or grounds for a big government coming into existence or not? Uh, so far, I've looked at the literature and I think there are two broad ideas on metrics. One is that people ask for a significant increase in actual legal power. So the Patriot Act gave the US government increased powers to do surveillance. These powers did not exist before the Patriot Act was passed. The other is that you start performing a particular function for a particular purpose, but then you gradually start using those tools or techniques for other functions as well. So there's a creep or an increase in the application of a tool or a technology to different areas. So the kinds of techniques you're using to fight the pandemic today, there is a fear that it could be used in a wider sphere of uh, our lives or society. And this could in turn create more kind of a totalitarian or a, a big brother government. So what is happening so far? So far we are seeing almost every country develop some kind of a contact tracing application. And as is obvious, the degree to which they store and manage data are different. The degree to which uh, they address privacy concerns vary across countries. Having said that, I think apps or applications are not the only way by which uh, surveillance is being done. The primary purpose of uh, doing surveillance is to basically prevent the pandemic. And a lot of old style, low tech physical surveillance is also taking place in order to try and identify who's come into contact with whom and to try and break the chain of transmission. So, and what we are seeing by and large so far is that most of these applications are narrowly designed for pandemic prevention. We are not yet seeing any significant evidence of uh, the scope of uh, these applications increasing. So it's not clear that yet, it's not clear yet that there is a significant function creep happening. Uh, what about state power? What we are seeing right now is states are using a lot of different kinds of technologies. Uh, they are quite intrusive compared to the way states were actually doing surveillance before this. Your body temperature is being recorded, who you come into contact with is being recorded. But the interesting part is that a lot of this is actually being deployed using existing powers that governments already have. Uh, in India, for example, we haven't needed a new law to do this kind of surveillance. Uh, there have been few exceptions. I think the UK had to pass a law to do individual contact tracing. I think there are one or two other countries that have had to do so. Uh, but for the most part, most of the kinds of surveillance that we are seeing uh, using contact tracing apps and others are actually enabled by existing law. Uh, like Rudra mentioned, apps like Arogya Setu and other contact tracing apps in different parts of the world, they have not yet been mandated. In China, I think some parts of uh, some applications have been mandated. 
but in most cases, these apps are still being encouraged. People, governments are exhorting individuals and communities to adopt them, uh, but they haven't yet been mandated on people. So most of the increased surveillance actually has its legal basis in existing state laws and existing government laws. We are not yet seeing governments make the claim for uh, a new kind of surveillance law or increased surveillance powers yet. So if you actually want to just initiate a discussion on this, you could say that so far what we are seeing is that we are seeing limited scope of uh, use. Most of the tools and techniques are so far being used for narrowly for pandemic prevention and it's enabled by existing law. We haven't yet seen claims for new laws or a change in how the government actually interacts with its citizens. Uh, this could change very rapidly. For example, if the pandemic cannot be uh, fought using these tools or using powers that governments already have, you might see cases of governments actually saying, hey, we need a complete change in how we do surveillance and how we do contact tracing. We need much more legal power. We need fewer checks and balances. We need to uh, mandate some kind of apps that are uh, that are being developed. Right? Uh, we need to go easy on transparency and security safeguards. A lot of these claims could be made in the future. They are not being made so far. Right? Uh, you could also have function creeps. You could have apps that are being currently used for a very narrow purpose, then being used for a wider range of activities. And here, I think an important point is that I think the success of some kind of technology or technique actually makes it legitimate. So if we are able to actually combat the pandemic using, using some of these surveillance techniques, we might then create a, some kind of a political opinion or consensus or a constituency that believes that the use of these kinds of applications can actually be used for social welfare in a wider context, not just for pandemic prevention. And that can then create grounds for uh, a greater increase in surveillance powers and so on. So that could actually legitimize government use of these tools in peacetime. So I'll leave it here. I think the my main point is we are seeing a lot of this uh, techniques of surveillance happening. Uh, a lot of these are still narrowly uh, being narrowly used. Uh, they are being used with existing government powers and not by the use of new government powers. And therefore, we need to think more about exactly how these tools should be developed and also thought about. Thank you. Anirudh, thank you so much. I'm going to turn to and you. And you've worked in the ecosystem of pandemic outbreaks in different parts of the world technology, you've worked with mobile tools, you've got a massive investment in practitioner work on the ground. How do you read the current pandemic and the relationship between technology, the needs of contact tracing and where we are today? Sure. And first of all, thank you so much to Carnegie India for having me today for this uh, really important webinar. I think it's been a really, uh, really big question on everyone's mind as technology expands um, and there's different offerings for uh, supporting public health efforts. So maybe before I answer the question, uh, I thought I could start a little bit with a reminder of what contact tracing is. Um, this might be already familiar to many on this call, but just in case, uh, contact tracing is one of the core pillars of disease control. So this is not COVID specific. This is something used for a lot of outbreak control. So the goal of contact tracing is to monitor people who are at high risk for becoming infected and thus potentially infecting others. Successful contact tracing, if done well, with or without technology, um, but if done well, can allow for targeting, targeted quarantine efforts, targeted isolation, rather than the mass lockdowns that we're seeing today. Of course, contact tracing being done well has to be actually within, embedded within a larger pub public health system effort. It's not the only thing done in disease control. So I do want to emphasize that contact tracing isn't the only piece of public health efforts. So to do contact tracing, there's three basic steps. Contact identification, contact listing, and contact follow-up. In the identification stage, 
Basically what happens is when you identify a positive case of COVID, you need to figure out who has been exposed to that person based on their activities during that past incubation period. So for COVID in the past 14 days, if I was uh, found positive, who did I interact with in the past 14 days? These could be family members, colleagues, friends, healthcare providers, et cetera. That's contact identification. On the contact listing side, and this is where technology can especially play a role too, uh, you identify each of these contacts, you inform them they are a contact and what the appropriate actions are to take now that you are a contact, uh, including the importance of monitoring themselves for symptoms, uh, knowing when to go to the hospital, uh, knowing why to quarantine or self-isolate. So that's contact listing. And the final piece is contact follow-up. So that's regular follow-up, usually by a healthcare professional or a contact tracer, a public health professional, regular follow-up with the contacts to monitor for symptoms, uh, to look for first signs of infection, ensure compliance to quarantine rules, and refer them to hospitals so they seek care early on. Depending on the disease profile, this process might differ. So for example, when we worked on contact tracing for Ebola in 2014, that uh, contact follow-up required someone to visit the contact every day for 21 days, which was the incubation period for Ebola, in order to uh, identify whether they had symptoms. For COVID, it's a little bit different. WHO guidelines is for a contact to monitor themselves and then have a visit at 14 days as well, just to see what the developments are. So maybe starting with that, those are the three basic steps. Now back to the question, what can technology do to help with contact tracing? I do think that a lot of the applications listed earlier that are coming out of Asia and now also out of the UK, out of Germany, out of the United States, et cetera, they do hold a lot of promise. I do think the concerns raised about privacy and scope creep are very, very valid. But I do think they, for the function of public health, they can actually provide a lot of promise in accelerating each of those three steps I mentioned earlier. So to frame that, maybe let's understand what would happen traditionally without any technology. Traditionally, each of those three steps would be done by manual interviews, by writing down names on paper, and the next day when you follow up with that person, in the case of Ebola, writing them down on paper again. So you lack that longitudinal record sometimes with paper systems. So from the technology side, there's different layers. Uh, we can start actually with even not looking at location data, not looking at Bluetooth data, even introducing technology for trying to uh, list those contacts, trying to create some sort of longitudinal record to see who needs follow-up, uh, when do I need to follow up with them, what are symptoms, etc. That's still an area of technology that can be explored as well. Um, now, when we move to the apps out of Asia, that's now something that's really novel, I think, in, in this time uh, in actually accelerating that contact identification stage. So what does it solve? Issues of recall. Who did I see in the last 14 days? Mm, I think I saw this person, this person, this person. So by using location data and Bluetooth data, the idea being proposed here is that you can complement those sort of interviews, not replace, let me emphasize that, not replace basic public health activities, but complement those activities with technology to solve issues of recall. Furthermore, you can ideally, and one term I've been hearing is instantaneous contact tracing, ideally, once you actually know who those contacts are, immediately contact that contact to let them know you've been at risk. Uh, we recommend self-isolation and look for these symptoms. So there's some opportunity there to also use technology to accelerate messaging and communications and awareness to someone who's been at risk. Um, some mathematical models, including out of the UK, have indicated that without this type of instantaneous contact tracing, the disease can become very, very difficult to control, given that COVID in particular, the scale and the speed at which it's spreading uh, is unprecedented. Uh, so to that end, I do think these sort of applications have a lot of promise, um, but I do think the conversations around privacy need to be taken very, very seriously for the various uh, reasons mentioned earlier. And thank you. I think I'm going to come back to you on some of your earlier experiences with technology and also your early experiences with Ebola, albeit that was a very different pandemic, a very different geography, it was localized, etc. But I think it will be important to come back to those questions for our audience. But if I can pivot now to Rahul Martin. Rahul, um, you've been one of the most popular voices in India when it comes to writing on technology. Now, we read us the opportunity to listen to you on technology in a very in a number of debates. 
And in a sense, one could say you've got yourself in a hot seat. You've advised the government on what is a major application that has a lot of promise, a lot of potential, but equally it has, there is some criticism from many different quarters. So perhaps it would be important to get your thoughts and perhaps for the larger audience, if you can also just walk us through what is Aragya Setu, why is it unique? And, and talk a little bit about the design elements of this application um, as you get on, Rao. Okay, uh, so, so thanks, Rudy. And um, uh, you know, thank you, Carnegie, for inviting me. And uh, also specifically, Anirudh and Anne for uh, a you know, beautiful sort of setup to what I want to discuss. I'm uh, you know, neither an economist nor a disease specialist. All I can talk about really is privacy. Uh, and I'll just pick up from where Anne left off. Um, so you know, just to speak about the app itself, uh, it's perhaps um, misleading to call this just a contact tracing app because this is uh, certainly more than that. And I don't think, um, uh, you know, I think it would be disingenuous to just say this is a contact tracing app. Um, right in the beginning of the app, the first thing that the app does is it actually collects some uh, symptomatic information about you. And the reason for that is to, uh, to do some sort of syndromic testing. Uh, uh, these are all self-declared uh, assessments of your health, just simple information, uh, which essentially corresponds to the uh, symptoms of the disease. And I think the idea behind this is to pick up whether uh, there are reports of people with high temperature, um, with the dry cough, all the, all the symptoms of the disease coming up in clusters so that um, you know, even if these, uh, these sort of uh, pockets were not picked up uh, through contact tracing, we're starting to get some sort of a sense of uh, uh, you know, the, these clusters that are developing. Hopefully, it'll help us get ahead of the game. The second thing, of course, is the contact tracing. And the contact tracing operates uh, through the Bluetooth, low energy Bluetooth uh, technology. Essentially, if you come within Bluetooth range of someone, um, the uh, app will record that you have come within Bluetooth range of that person. Of course, uh, so let me, let me step back. Um, this assumes that the people who are coming in contact with each other both have the Arogya Setu app on, installed, and with the uh, Bluetooth active. And if that happens, the app sort of senses that there's another person coming close to, um, close to me. Um, and there's an algorithm which runs, which actually can figure out what the distance is, what the duration is. And the two phones exchange this information. Uh, and then if one of these people uh, tests positive for COVID, uh, because there's a list of all the people that he, he or she came in touch with, came in contact with over the past you know, 30 days or 14 days, depending on, on the way in which uh, you want to analyze it, um, those people are potentially people who have been infected at the time when the person was moving around asymptomatically in society. Uh, and so those are the people to contact. So that's essentially uh, uh, the design of the app. And obviously, uh, I am in, a hot, in the hotspot, Rudy, because um, you know, this is a privacy invasive uh, uh, feature. So um, you know, as, uh, as Anirudh and Anne have said, uh, in these extreme times, there is uh, clearly a need to do something like this. Uh, there are benefits that the technology provides. And so the challenge to me really is how do you uh, maximize the benefit that technology provides, this ability to uh, go beyond recall, which really is, the, is the, fa the weak link as far as contact tracing is concerned if you do it manually, um, uh, and therefore leverage that. But at the same time, uh, don't do some of the things that Anirudh was concerned about, which is allow function creep, uh, allow surveillance. And so uh, there are three basic things that the app does uh, to address these concerns. And you know, of course, the best scenario would be not to have the app at all. But if we have the app, what is the best way uh, to do it in a privacy preserving way? The first thing is the moment you register, your registration information is uh, stored securely and hashed with a unique identifier. It's, uh, you, we call it a DID, it's a device ID. And from the time that you register, uh, you know, any time thereafter, the only information um, that uh, uh, that identifies you is this DID. And so there's no connection to your personal information, either your name, your mobile number, or your age, when contacts are shared. The second uh, feature that we have is that as far as possible, all the information, which is the information of the people you came in contact with, as well as your location information, these are the, these are the pieces of information that are dynamically picked up by the app. 
all that information stays on the app as far as possible. Uh, it is only pulled to the cloud uh, when one of the people you have come in contact with has been positively tested uh, for COVID. And, and this is a virological test. So, you know, what Anne mentioned, which is um, instantaneous contact tracing, the app currently does not do it. Uh, it may, as Anne says, when, you know, this becomes a, a, a very difficult uh, disease to manage, we may move to that. But at this point in time, the uh, source for pulling the information is the positive virological test for COVID. And if one of my contacts is uh, tested positive virologically, the, all the people that he or she has come in contact with over the past 30 days is pulled from the phone. And then the intervention that Anne mentioned, which is reaching out to them, contacting them, um, speaking to them, et cetera, is managed based on that. Okay. The third element, uh, so, so if you think about it, if you look at the percentage of people who get infected to the percentage of uh, people who are not, uh, roughly, you know, let's say two, 3%. Uh, and so of the 71 million people who've downloaded the app, there is a chance that maybe two or 3% of those people will have their information leave their phone ever. Uh, but that's not enough because you know you are amassing these databases, and one of the concerns was that over a period of time, with the app going on collecting the data, it becomes actually a dangerous uh, database. And so it's really important to delete the data on a, a very aggressive uh, time scale. Uh, so there are three ways in which the data is deleted. Uh, if it's on your app and it hasn't been pulled to the cloud, which as I said is likely to be you know 97, 98 percent of the users. Then on a 30-day rolling basis, the data is deleted from your, uh, from your device. If you are one of those people who, uh, 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 who has come in contact with someone who, uh, is, you know, who tests positive, your data would have been taken up to the cloud. But if for 45 days you have not turned positive, the data is deleted from the cloud as well. And finally, if you uh, are one of those people who uh, uh, it, you know, does get infected and your data is on the cloud within 60 after 60 days of you being declared uh, uh, of, of having been cured of COVID, the data is deleted. So what that does is essentially uh, you know this concern about surveillance um, uh, in, in it's it's uh, it's tackled in two ways. One, there's no uh, there's no real time. Uh, maintenance of location information on a government server, uh, which would be one of the hallmarks, one of the one of the necessities uh, for surveillance, right? Uh, that information, even though it's collected, stays on your phone and it is not pinged to the server on a real-time basis. Secondly, uh, all this information is deleted so that uh, at best, um, you know, if all of this is done and dusted, we'll have to wait for 60 days after the last person is cured and there will be no data uh, remaining on the server. Not, not only that, on a an, on an, uh, real-time basis, that data is being cleaned up from the phones of all the people who have it and from the servers uh, of the government. Um, so, uh, and you know, there, are many, there are many other features that uh, perhaps you know, I'll, uh, I'll wait, uh, Rudy, for your guidance to go into, but just, just very simply, uh, I've been very, very careful uh, to mention clearly in the privacy policy what the purpose is and what the use is. So if you read the privacy policy, the purpose and use are very narrowly uh, defined. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the, the, uh, depending on the, on the information that you collect, there is a separate purpose and separate use, as well as a separate retention policy for all of them. The reason I did that is because this makes it very clear that this is the stated purpose of the government. Um, and you know, if the government or if anyone uh, uses for any other purpose, then you know that that uh, purpose has been changed. And the purpose, if it is to be changed, needs to be done with consent or with uh, an appropriate mechanism. Um, uh, you know, as a privacy lawyer, I am very used to uh, preparing you know, these loosey-goosey, airy-fairy types of uh, purposes because uh, you never know what you'd use it for in the future, uh, and you know, tech companies tend to want to do to do that. This is extremely specific, uh, and in fact, I'd I'd welcome any um, uh, suggestions as to how to make it uh, tighter and more specific. Uh, but that's the idea that you know within the ambit of uh, controlling uh, the the pandemic, uh, this is the information that we're collecting and using. 
So Ral, I'm going to just push you a little bit because I think this is a, it's a key topic. It's becoming sharper every day. Um, one, I'm going to ask you an unfair question, which is if Rahul Martin, the lawyer who, who had nothing to do with Arogya Situ, was to audit this app and keeping the various limitations in mind, what is it that would trouble you? So if you just keep that question in a box for a second, and you know, and which leads me to some couple of the points that you mentioned, um, having surveyed a lot of the criticism on the app, and just to go to specifics just for two minutes, you brought up purpose limitation. Yet from my lay understanding, purpose limitation, if I may just read, says the personal information collected will not be used for any other purpose, as you say, save as required in order to comply with the legal requirement. And I think that's where a lot of the skeptics begin to see a degree of ambiguity. Similarly, there's a position on storage limitation, which you've also amplified and made clear. But yet again, there is, there is a rider which says, lawfully be used, otherwise required. So I think if you could just clarify for the audience in terms of um, do these clauses or do these lines necessarily add ambiguity, or is there just no way out of this? The fact of the matter is, we're living in an age where we need efficiency. Um, there's no privacy, There's no point in aspiring for privacy perfection, many would argue, for instance. But how, how would you take on these criti this criticism? Raul, I think if you could just unmute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I, I got a little carried away. Um, so, so look, uh, uh, the requirement um, uh, that you mentioned. So f first of all, if there is a legal requirement, uh, for instance, in, uh, in relation to the disease, if ICMR wants to keep information for research purposes, uh, if there is uh, a, a statutory requirement to hold information for a particular period of time, obviously we are required uh, to abide by whatever the legal requirements are. If you look at privacy laws anywhere in the world, the exception uh, is always uh, as required by law, particularly when there are retention requirements. So for instance, the income tax law requires you to, to hold information for seven years. Uh, you can't have a three-year data retention policy and say, I'm gonna delete the data because that's my data retention policy. There isn't a, a, a corresponding legal requirement to hold it. So, um, and uh, it, you know, if I could list all the various laws under which uh, the information could be retained, I would, but you know, once again, that's, that's, not, a, that's not feasible. So that's the, that's the specific uh, response to that. But I think you should also look very carefully at the way in which uh, this uh, has been written. Uh, so you know, essentially, the, uh, the use of the information, uh, depending on the type of information, it varies. And it, this, this requirement of you know, legal uh, use is not for uh, every sort of information. Right, um, and you know, if you if you look at the information, there is uh, uh, information relating to, let's say, uh, the the location information. Location information is only used for COVID. If you look at the contact information, the contact information is only used for COVID. There is no uh, escape in terms of any other legal requirement. Okay, Raul, we've got a range of questions for everybody on the panel, and lots of specific questions on the app as could be expected. Um, but I'm going to just keep them in a second. Anirudh, if I can just turn to you, um, your opening kind of statement, if you like, in your presentation, make clear the, the problems and the issues um, that might arise uh, with regards to decisions that are made today but are not fully protected. And we've got a question from Vibhor Jain, who has a pretty straightforward forward question, which is that, are we just making too much of privacy? The fact of the matter is, we need an app. We need, there are 300 million Indians who have a smartphone, even if you assume that half of those are able to actually use the smartphone and download the app, for instance, that's a large number of people in urban centers. So are we just overemphasizing or privileging privacy at a time um, when we frankly don't need to? Thanks for that question. I think uh, so in my opening comments, I was trying to set the context for how we should think about privacy in the context of this pandemic and the tools that we are using. Uh, on the specific question, I think, yes, I personally believe that we are possibly making too much of a big deal on privacy right now. And 
I think here's one way to think about it. We are right now, all of us, sitting inside our houses. We've very willingly surrendered our privileges and freedoms about going outside, running businesses, going out for a walk, for movies, and so on. But we've actually compromised on a lot of our, our other freedoms fairly willingly. So I have been struggling to think of an objective criteria by which I can actually privilege privacy in that context. And so privacy is more important than all these other freedoms. Right? So that's one way to think about it, that we are doing pretty much everything as a society, as a community, to prevent the spread of this pandemic, including compromising at least temporarily on a lot of our other freedoms. So why should privacy be privileged over everything else? Uh, I think the point I wanted to make in the opening comments was not that privacy ought to be privileged right now, but what are the markers or the indicators that would actually tell us that something is going wrong or that we are at an inflection point where we need to start worrying? I think that's what I was trying to communicate. I'd love to comment on this as well, if, if okay. Yeah, thanks. I was in fact going to bring you in and on your comments, but also just to perhaps put this in perspective, you've worked in this area for a long time, uh, for a decade. Is So can you just put some of these debates for us in context, given the fact that you've worked with pandemics in the past? Sure. Uh, and, and maybe I'll start with first that I, I do think that the privacy discussion has to be had. Uh, it is a very good question, and, uh, and I think uh, Anirudh put it really well. And what is the what are other freedoms we're already giving up? There are trade offs, uh, and there's definitely trade offs that people don't want to take. But in a time like this, I think there are trade offs that have to be considered. Do we uh, do we give up our freedom of privacy? Um, do we give up our freedom of going outside? Our freedom of working, etc. We don't know the right answer. Uh, so, but the question I do think has to be had because. Um, if, if data is misused, and I think that's a big fear, if data is misused, and if there's a lack of trust in uh, your government, um, that can become a big problem. Uh, you know, it was referenced the Patriot Act earlier, and I think there's, you know, there's still debates nowadays if the Patriot Act was as effective as, as it was meant to be, or if it was, um, or if people went really cross the line with it. I'm not sure, that's not really my area of expertise, but I do think that is a really good explanation or reason for why the privacy discussion has to be had. Um, in a lot of countries where these applications have been rolled out, I think one thing that hasn't been mentioned yet is that in many of these countries, whether it's Singapore or Taiwan, South Korea, uh, there's trust in the government. There is trust in the government for how they're going to use the data that when they say this is the purpose of the data that is the purpose of the data and then we as a collective whole in the population need to do our part. That trust might not exist in every single country and the leadership is not necessarily there in every single country to be able to use this effectively and there could be risks. Uh, we see this a lot in the United States risks for how that data might be used for other purposes, whether it's for registries um, that go beyond the purpose of the, what COVID is supposed to be. Um, so I, I do think that the discussion has to be had. Now this being said, from my perspective, and to come back to your question, uh, Rudy, my perspective is, you know, when I worked on Ebola in mobile uh, tracing, contact tracing apps, let me start by saying that this was a different type of app. This was very contained to a very particular region. Uh, so we didn't have Google and Apple offering massive technology overhauls to help with contact tracing. We didn't have people creating applications that uh, actually tracked location or Bluetooth. What that technology was, was really trying to digitize information and help a contact tracer follow up. But even that back then in 2014, there was a lot of backlash saying, why are we using technology? It's not gonna work, paper's fine, paper's fine, paper's fine. So even back then in 2014, just trying to digitize um, digitize records, uh, which I think at least in today's age is not is less controversial, just trying to digitize records, people were already concerned. What if the database is hacked, et cetera? So those questions still came up, but you know, the trade-off once again is, well, what happens if you don't do this? You know, we understand that no one wants to have their data collected necessarily in this way, um, though, to be fair, we uh, we also asked for consent from each of the people we, uh, we uh, uh, who were included in the contact tracing and there were no concerns that were brought up. 
Um, and similarly, uh, I, I believe some of the studies have shown out of uh, Asia, some of the Asian countries that people have not necessarily shown that much concern about privacy. Um, potentially, I'm sure there's exceptions. Uh, so, but this being said, back to Ebola, what is the consequence of not doing this? If you're relying on purely manual systems, purely paper systems, are people going to fall through the cracks? And if one person falls through the cracks, are you going to explode the disease and create additional hotspots later on uh, from that one person, from those two people um, that makes the disease harder and harder to control? So from my perspective, I, I, I agree with Rolfo that it's not necessarily, you know, should we consider technology at this at this point in time? I think, given our population, our global population, number of people, uh, number of people impacted, some degree of technology should be considered, unless you have a really, really strong operational paper-based systems. Um, but even so, I also wonder if the speed is fast enough. But some degree of technology has to be considered. The question is, to what degree? Uh, to what degree are we, do we need to talk about location-based tracking? Do we need to talk about Bluetooth-based tracking? And if so, if those benefits are, are worthwhile enough to make that trade-off, how do we put in those protections that Rahul mentioned to make sure that we don't have scope, we don't have function creep, that we make sure that uh, people, we trust the government with this data, that we understand and trust that the government will truly use this data for the purposes defined for. Thanks, Anne. And before I move back to Rahul with a couple of more questions is, I wanted to ask you is, what's going on in the United States right now? You've got 21 states that, as we understand it, that will be lifted from the lockdown. What are the ways in which technology is helping to solve for the problem? Is it enough from your, from your point of view? Well, sitting in one of the hotspots in, in the United States, it's a very good question. And I, I, I wouldn't say that our federal response is necessarily the strongest. I, I do think what we have been seeing state by state, though, is very interesting. Um, sitting in New York, seeing how our governor responding is very different from other countries that are lifting lockdowns, in my opinion, very early um, and potentially not in the best informed way. So I think the technology potential is there. Have I actually seen technology deployed yet? No, I have not. I think there are uh, some cities in discussion. So for example, the city of San Francisco has partnered with the company Damagi, uh, which was started by alumni from MIT. And this was actually, Damagi actually uh, deployed the application that I used for Guinea uh, for Ebola in 2014. So I, I do think individual cities uh, in some states are considering technology, but I have not seen any effectively deployed yet. But the potential I think is there. And if states are going to lift their lockdowns, um, and once again, I think this itself is a big question as well. New York, New York State, where I live, I think they could, now that we, we've been supposedly past the peak and cases are declining, hospitalizations are declining, and we're at a point where contact tracing might make sense again in order to lift lockdowns and isolate quarantined, um, uh, isolate and target people who are under quarantine better rather than do a mass lockdown. So now that we're at that point again, uh, over the curve to start talking about contact tracing to avoid a second wave. Now this is the time where I think that technology in particular, we really want to examine closely to see how that can help with those efforts to try to mitigate the risk of a second wave. So now that's a good jumping off point for you because I think in India and perhaps one of the strangely, one of the underappreciated facts is the, the ability of the Indian state and the ecosystem, especially in the South of the country, to turn potential into reality when it comes to technology. The largest digital ID program in the world was created by people in government um, and associates around. The Arogya Setu has been created from what we understand by a volunteer who's part of a think tank, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I think that's how it's described in Bangalore, which is now owned by the government. So I, could, I was just wondering is if you could just tell us a little bit about that ecosystem and could you tell us a little bit about who built Arogya Setu, who owns Arogya Setu? Is ICMR the one who's in charge of our data today? Okay, uh, so some of these questions, to be honest, I don't have a, a complete answer. Uh, it was not built by one individual. It was built by uh, a, a group of volunteers. And this is uh, genuinely a group of volunteers um, I know from, from many companies. Uh, uh, so essentially tech people, not all in Bangalore, to be completely clear, uh, people in Delhi, uh, some people in Bangalore. Um, this, this app was also built, and uh, perhaps this, is, this doesn't get enough airtime, 
uh, there has been a lot of correlation um, between uh, the tech people and epidemiologists. Uh, so, you know, essentially, uh, if you think about contact tracing, there's a big difference between sitting down and having a, a meal with someone, uh, the extent of contact that you could have in that situation, as opposed to, uh, you know, passing by someone peripherally at the edge of your Bluetooth for a second as you're walking on the road. Uh, and, uh, you know, you would, if you, if you don't uh, plot these two things and give them different weightage, uh, you're going to have a whole bunch of false positives. You could potentially create a panic because, uh, you know, every last person will be called and that's not optimal. So the uh, app and, and, you know, I wish this got a little more airtime, has an algorithm uh, at the back end, which calculates the probability of infection. And the factors that go into this is proximity, is the duration, and is uh, you know, duration of the actual contact as well as the recency. Uh, so you know, if you if you contacted uh, someone for two seconds, uh, fifteen days ago or fourteen days ago, um, the uh, chance, your probability of infection from that person is actually quite low. Uh, so these are the sorts of things that um, the app actually uh, calculates. And before people are called. Uh, the, uh, the, the process really is jointly between you know, the ICMR, uh, uh, the information uh, is stored on, uh, on NIC servers. So essentially it's uh, uh, the, the NIC, which is the informatics arm of the government is responsible for the app side of things. Uh, but ICMR is very much involved in this because the uh, positive testing uh, uh, of a person which triggers the whole, uh, you're pulling out the contacts from people's phone uh, is, is, a, is a signal that's sent from ICMR because currently all the tests are being aggregated um, by ICMR. And so uh, th there's that medical element to it. So for people who think that this is just an app, which is uh, you know, only, uh, only automatically um, flagging someone as uh, yellow, orange, or red, uh, it's more than that. Uh, the, the yellow, orange, red comes, uh, yellow and orange comes out of your self-assessment, but the red is very much a virological uh, assessment. Uh, and then, you know, the, the uh, app actually calculates all the probabilities to figure out whether you are someone who needs to be contacted, to be tested, um, or someone who can just be given some information to say, you know, stay at home for a bit and, and see what you're doing. Um, I, the, the big concern for me really was uh, both false positives, um, where, which would cause a panic, as well as false negatives. And I'm in some ways uh, much more concerned about false negatives. Uh, if the algorithm got it wrong, then someone who should actually be self-isolating could be walking around uh, on the street. And that uh, potentially is much more dangerous because if, if we get it wrong and we tell people that you're green when actually it's, it's dangerous, um, and when people start trusting the app so much that they believe this, this color coding, that could be really dangerous. Thanks, Raoul. We've got uh, three, uh, three questions which I'll cluster together from Prashant Singh, Karan Vinayak, and um, General Chakrabarti, as well as Ambassador Suresh Goel. Uh, so very quickly, Raul, I think, I mean, these are more detailed questions of the app, but I think it's worth going through them very briefly. The first is, um, Prashant Singh asks is that, why not just add a sunset clause? I think you've answered that to a certain extent with the 30 days and the fact that only two to 3% will actually make it up to the cloud. But I think if you could just address that. Um, the second question from Karan Vinayak is that, I guess it's a straightforward answer, but if you download the app, but you turn off the location, the app doesn't work, I'm guessing. But if you could right. just answer that for him. And one of the concerns that Ambassador Suresh Goel expresses is that could this become mandatory like China? Okay, so look, Sunset Clause, uh, extremely valid question. And, and that's certainly something that uh, was the driving uh, reason behind uh, th that deletion uh, uh, policy. Um, and so, you know, I, I think the critical information, which is sort of the most privacy uh, invasive, where you have been and who you have come in contact with, there is absolutely a sunset clause. Uh, after a particular period of time, as I said, that information will not remain on your phone, uh, on, the, uh, on the cloud, anywhere. Um, uh, there is, uh, is some information which remains, and that is your demographic information that you uh, provide up in the beginning, your name and, and phone number, because, you know, your name and phone number does need to exist so they can contact you in case, uh, you know, you, you, you uh, come in contact with someone, uh, you know, at a later point in time. Um, of course, if the, if the app is deleted, then you don't come in contact with anyone. The reason, sorry, uh, and, and uh, just to be completely clear, the information that's collected is name, phone number, age, gender, profession, and the countries you visited. 
Um, name and phone number is obvious. Uh, this is a contact tracing app, so you need to know your name and phone number to contact you. Age, well, the disease stratifies quite uh, uh, clearly by age. Uh, and so uh, older people uh, tend to uh, 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 die uh, from the disease more than younger people. Gender, uh, from all statistics, it looks like it stratifies more in favor of men than women, as in men are more likely to, uh, to get it than women. Uh, gen uh, profession, of course, um, uh, you know, frontline health workers, um, perhaps uh, the delivery boys, uh, people at the grocery stores, these are people who, are, uh, who have a high uh, chance of collect, uh, contacting it, and that's the reason why uh, the, uh, this information is collected. If you look at the privacy policy, it says that the use of this information is to create heat maps, to create reports, to try and figure out how the disease is moving through society by gender, age, and profession. Uh, and, and so, you know, it, it, uh, there, there should be a sunset uh, period for this as well. Um, at, you know, at, at this point in time, it's, there, there is no sunset period on this. Uh, that's, the, that's the way the, uh, the app is, uh, is designed, but uh, certainly uh, that, that also should exist. Um, as far as the uh, location, yes. Uh, so there are two things that, that the uh, app uh, collects on a regular basis. It, keeps, it requires you to keep your Bluetooth on and your location on. So if you turn both off, obviously it doesn't work. Um, uh, if you turn only location off, uh, it doesn't work as well. Um, but the contact tracing part of it actually doesn't use a uh, location. It only uses the Bluetooth. So the contact tracing uh, part of it will still work. The reason why location is important, and to be clear, location is collected only once every 15 minutes or once every 30 minutes. I'm, I'm, I'm not exactly sure of the way it's been, it's been, um, it's been configured. Uh, but the reason why uh, location is also important to, in a country like India is, look, at this point in time, there are 71 million downloads. Uh, in our urban areas alone, the, the core of the urban area, there are 200, 250 million people. If you add the peri-urban area as well, there are 400 million people. So it is uh, very, very likely uh, that uh, the app is not going to cover absolutely everyone. And as you know, the urban density in India is so high that we actually do need to uh, identify areas where, you know, if there are a lot of people passing through an area, we need to know that this is an area that needs uh, to be sanitized. It's clearly mentioned in the policy. That's the that's what it's it's used for. So if you switch the location uh, tracking off, you will still be able to do the contact tracing, but that location feature uh, is not there, and so the app is not going to work uh, as well uh, as it should have. Sorry, there was a third question, and, and you know, my gray cells are not what they were. No, I, I think you've uh, I think you've basically answered the questions. Thanks, Raul. Um, we've got lots more questions on details, but I'm going to put the details aside for a while. I'm just going to take the conversation a bit broader. Um, I think there's a, there's a good point is Mike Nelson, who is the head of the Tech and International Affairs Program at Carnegie DC, asks a question that I think and you touched on, which is the importance of trust. So Mike says that good data protection laws generally encourage transparency. It, it, are they are designed to increase trust between in the social contract between the citizen and, and the state. Um, I want to come to Anil you in a second, which is how relevant is this debate today? I mean, it seems to me that in order to increase trust, you're going to have better communication strategy. And but before that, I just want to bring in Anirudh for a second. Is Anirudh is do you, is, do you think that one of I mean, listening to Rahul today, for instance, and Rahul, you know, to be honest, I think perhaps this is what the government needs to do more: is to get out in front of the debate, make some of these arguments, communicate better find different ways of doing a campaign. I mean, you know, for many of us in India, for instance, in the last six to eight months, just as the privacy bill got going, what you saw was Google and Facebook and other companies pivot to nice ads, animations, cartoons, to just explain to different populations in vernacular language. I don't know, do you think one of the problems over here is the inability to communicate with the view to build trust? Or do you think that there are some genuine issues here, as you mentioned in your opening presentation, that we need to keep in mind somewhere? I think it's a very important question and I think communication is really key to how you actually get acceptance into some of these technologies. Uh, I think Singapore, for example, did it really well. I think the prime minister would come out every morning, make a or evening, make a statement, communicate effectively. Uh, generally, their communication outreach to the public was quite good. Having said that, I don't think India has done too badly narrowly on Arogya Setu. We've already seen about uh, seven crore downloads. I think uh, uh, I think fewer people pay tax, income tax in India. 
So I think that's quite that's quite a commendable achievement to have developed an app and actually get that kind of a number in within uh, I think what is basically around two weeks. So, but yeah, I think the broader point is very well taken. Communication is important, and I think beyond a point, coercive measures don't really help. They have the counterproductive. They scare people. People. It's not just a question of distrust. It's also a question of trying to avoid compliance or trying to avoid coming under the gaze of the state because you don't want to be subject to some kind of a punishment or a punitive measure taken by someone. So I would definitely prefer governments being more communicative in general. And I think even with the way the broader pandemic containment has happened in India, we could have done better on communication. But on Arogya Setu, I think narrowly we've done pretty well so far. So before I turn to Anlu, uh, we've got a question from Ranjana Medin, which I think ties quite nicely with what you just said, is the importance that downloading this app or using this app should not be coercive. And she has the question that in her view that um, Zomato has been asked to get everybody who uses Zomato onto the app. There are other companies across India today who say that they've got emails from the government to say is that it's that responsibility to get 1 million people, half a million people, or even up to 50 million people onto this app. Do you think that this is the right way to do, um, to get the downloads that you need? And is the view that the larger population, for instance, um, will see the efficiency side of the app, which is very important, rather than necessarily be mesmerized by the privacy aspects of the app in themselves? So how do you bridge that gap? Is this the right, is this the right strategy at the moment or a necessary one? Yeah, I would, I think, still like to make a distinction between the government exhorting uh, industries and sectors of the economy to download the app and using some legal power to mandate it. I think there is a distinction. Not every letter from the government is a legal mandate. Uh, I think that needs to be uh, something that has, that has to be considered carefully. Uh, but broadly on, say, even things like Zomato, I think, like Andrew mentioned, there is a trade-off. Uh, what we've had as cases of delivery was uh, testing positive. That has in, in turn created a fear of people not wanting to order in. That actually hurts not just the economy, not just these delivery boys and their economy, but also the overall effectiveness of the containment. If you can't order in and you're dependent on ordering in, for example, sooner or later, you're going to be tempted to violate the lockdown. So if this app can actually help uh, in sustaining the lockdown in actually overcoming this fear of ordering in, in this very specific example, I think it is something that needs to be considered positively. So we do have to think of the trade-offs in different contexts. I think in this context, the trade-off is worth having. And you, just from your experience is, how do you build this trust? I mean, it's, it's a larger ecology question. As you said, some countries, there is a stronger social contract. There is a higher degree of trust. In some countries, there isn't for, for a variety of other reasons. But in emergencies such as this, where you require data, you require to follow people, for instance, you, you know, and it's just not helping the individual who has the app, but it's those around the individual, for instance, so if there's a herd mentality to the technology cascading, for instance, the idea is that you've actually got a lot of data that can help kind of track this. There are trust issues, for instance. What was done during Ebola or was anything done during Ebola, for instance, or from your own experience in building trust, but building it fast? Yeah. Um, so, so first of all, I think more generally, I, I do think that the while the legal framework helps, it's not necessarily something that general, and I think it's necessary, um, I do think that that has to be complemented by a strong communication strategy. If the individual person is deciding whether or not to download the app, not every individual is going to be consulting the legal framework around it. They're instead going to be more exposed to what is the general communication strategy? Do I trust the government? Do I trust the people pushing this app that they're actually going to use my data uh, for uh, good purposes to try to control, um, control this pandemic? So I do think a strong communication strategy if it's not by the leadership that currently is uh, is well viewed in the public, then perhaps putting another face on it um, to encourage, you know, why why is it that this app might be might be useful? So I think a strong communication strategy with a trusted face to the to the application with clear delineation of purpose uh, is really important. 
one thing we've seen in New York State, and this is not related to technology, but generally in what we're seeing from our leadership in trying to cultivate trust with the public to try to encourage them to stay inside, is not necessarily mandating, saying, if you don't stay inside, you're going to be fined $1,000, but instead using a communication strategy to say, I don't like this either. I'm tired too. New Yorkers are tired. We all don't want to do this, but the more we stay inside, the more we can, uh, the faster we can try to control this thing. So I think the messaging is really important. The empathy is really important um, to feel like a collective whole rather than, oh, the government's telling me to do this. I don't want to do that. So that messaging is really important. Now for Ebola, trust was a huge, huge issue, not even just around contact tracing, but generally the entire uh, health response. You've got scared community members, people coming in in full hazmat suits and PPE, taking away dead bodies and uh, in, in ways that were really important for public health because transmission through burials and traditional customs back then was a huge, huge issue. So there was a valid rational reason for people to do that. But the way it was done, unfortunately, just violated trust. What did people do? They started hiding the bodies. They started transporting bodies across borders and hiding them at border checks, et cetera. So that was a huge problem. So there might have been a public health rationale, but I do think there's an approach that needs to take into account culture, needs to take into account tradition uh, and anthropology in general uh, that uh, needs to be considered when devising strategies. So what was effective? I mean, I, I don't think I can name actually specific things. I think eventually we came down to a point of just being emergencies and using, using community-based health workers in particular, I think uh, was effective, um, but using community-based health workers to spread messaging, to spread communication strategy. So then when I'm hearing, this is the reason why um, uh, why you need to stay inside. This is the reason why you need to report your symptoms ASAP. This is the reason why when someone passes away, uh, you need to be very careful about not, not following your traditions or being very careful about uh, how you approach it. When you hear that from your neighbor who you've known uh, for years, uh, when you hear that from someone you trust, uh, but who's been trained in this type of messaging, that's a very different concept than if you hear it from uh, someone you don't know at all, someone coming in in a hazmat suit and who's very busy, has very good rationale, but someone you just don't trust. So I think who delivers that messaging can be really, really important. Um, which is one more thing to add. I think one thing I saw even outside Ebola, when we do general disease surveillance and general uh, communications, we really try to figure out how to tailor it to the right community, the right uh, country setting. So for example, in some settings in Kenya where I worked in the past, we found that people really trusted the local radio station. That's what they listened to every day. So what did we do? We recorded the radio station, uh, the radio station, the person who was broadcasting their voice, and we actually recorded a message on why they should wash hands, for example, put it on the phone that we were using for uh, supporting case management, so that when the health worker was talking to them about it, talking to the patient or the, I should say the mother or the individual about the disease and, and key behavior change aspects, they could also say, play, and here's also a message from your local radio station. So I think the communication strategy, uh, there's very, many diverse ways, but whatever the case needs to be tailored to um, what uh, the community you're working with is going to trust. Thanks, and Raul, if I just bring you in here, I think there seems to be the two dimensions to trust and two audiences for trust. I mean, there are many audiences for trust, so I'm just generalizing here. But if the idea is to bridge social distancing using social communication, and to make apps such as this more socially acceptable to large population. So basically bridge the trust, for instance, while at the higher level and for the audience that, you know, essentially that geek out on apps that follow this stuff on an everyday basis, I guess one of the questions that they would have, and it's a question that's been posed by one of the members of audience, Akshat Jain, is why not just make this app open source? Like Singapore has done, why not allow people to audit the app, um, telling us exactly about how the data is gonna be used? But for a different audience where, you know, questions around auditing an app is it's like a question for Mars or Venus, for instance, for the, which is the largest population of India. There the trust seems, the, the communication strategy seems to require, we've got a large network of Anganwadi workers across India. There is a health system and a health network. Is this app or even beyond their app is the basic social communications about the need for contact tracing where it goes from app to human being to large populations. Is that happening in your viewpoint? 
So, uh, I, I mean, I don't know the extent to which um, all of this is done. So let me just speak to, to what I know. Um, I, 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 and look, great points on trust. I think it's super important that an app like this uh, has trust because, um, you, you know, the, the blind faith in the government is really not going to get this uh, app to the point where it will be useful. We really have to know um, that this app is going to, to, to help. Um, uh, my understanding is that there is uh, a communication plan that has been implemented. Uh, I know that um, you know on on Doordarshan, which uh, is the TV, the, you know, the national TV channel, which has really wide uh, viewership, uh, perhaps in the hinterland, uh, there have been programs out. I you know I've personally seen uh, very engaging uh, cartoon style videos that uh, explain how uh, the app works. Uh, and so you know just just in terms of what does it do? Uh, does it take care of your privacy? Uh, those messages, I think, a certain amount of work has been done uh, to do that. As I said, I, I honestly don't know um, the channels uh, through which it is sent out. So ideally, you know, health workers, Anganwadi workers, uh, and people like that should should be getting hold of it. Um, but certainly, you know, certainly that that is there. And you know, the point that you made slightly earlier, uh, the government should come out um, and and speak about this. And uh, uh, you know, I, I you know the. Uh, before it was it was uh, launched, or rather before the before version two was launched, I had an op-ed out which covered essentially the three points which I said um, uh, with regard to what are the privacy uh, features of the app. Um, but you're right. I think you know if, if we could do more and if we could do it better, uh, that would certainly help. And, and with regard to open source, uh, I, I believe that we should open source it, uh, and uh, I said as much uh, in uh, my op-ed. Um, uh, I, and I've uh, uh, told the government that that's my view. Uh, I, hopefully, the government will, you know, will will open source it at some point in time. I know that the government is happy to have it audited, but you know, uh, the the problem with open source and with audit is open source is useful, as you said, to that geek community that understands it. I, I mean, I, you know, I'm a technology lawyer. I wouldn't understand it um, if uh, if it, if I was shown the code. And there's a tiny sliver of people who would. And then, do you trust that person? Uh, who does understand it to actually represent your concerns properly? Uh, that that sort of is the concern. Um, so you know, I think particularly in a country like India, and I think this is true for anywhere in the world, uh, in the context of privacy, where you know I've said all of these wonderful things um, as to what the app does, uh, we need to have some trusted layer that will say, look, Rahul says all of these things are there in the privacy policy and therefore in the app. But can someone verify that it is the app actually does delete things every 30 days? Uh, and that has to be someone that you know, people trust. We don't, I believe, anywhere in the world have that sort of a layer. And I think that layer is really important as we get more and more complex technologies uh, that are brought into play to solve complex societal problems. Um, and you know, I'm going to plug my accountability framework that I wrote now, what, three years ago? And I know it's been, it's been a long time since I've, uh, since I've done this. Uh, but in that, I, I uh, said that we should have a institutional layer called uh, the learned intermediary. So essentially, people who are learned about the way in which privacy enhancing technologies and privacy preserving technologies work and can uh, certify that application services and uh, you know, any kind of technology uh, actually does these things um, in a useful way. And these people have their incentives aligned with the user so that they're always looking out for the user's interest uh, as far as this is concerned. You know, I think um, uh, at the end of this, uh, we're going to have so many live lessons on you know, the kinds of things we need to put into uh, privacy law um, that you know, I've been waiting for this law for 10 years now. Uh, maybe we'll need to put in some uh, heavy amendments into it before, before it comes out. Rao, thanks a lot. We've got about a couple of minutes. So I'm going to end with one question for each one of you. And I think your point on essentially a learned ombudsman that can serve as a trust repository, if you like, um, for privacy is important and pushes me to think about standards, which is, you know, in India, we've got friends in, in the south of the country who have spent their lives on technology who would argue that India's engineering technology for the world, it's building our digital infrastructure. But at the moment, really, it's building our infrastructure for India. For one reason or the other, it's just, it, we've just not been very good at exporting these interfaces to Asia, to different parts of South Asia. So whether it's some payments, whether it's perhaps an Arogya Setu, and maybe Arogya Setu becomes an example of how different parts of South Asia, or even 
countries that India works very closely with can come into kind of adopting these standards in themselves is, and I suppose my, my question is, um, do you think that one of the opportunities or silver linings in this time of crisis, for instance, will push countries like India, will push the valley in the United States, will push those in Brussels who are sometimes seem to be too cussed about technology and over-regulate sometimes when it comes to technology, trying to come together to create a consensus in creating architectures that can benefit more people in a shorter amount of time, especially in emergencies such as this. So perhaps for the last word, if I could just go to Anirudh, essentially, can technology help us cooperate better and can we cooperate better through technology? Anirudh, Rahul, and then the last word, and Louis. Yeah, so I think short answer, yes. I don't know what the probability of people cooperating uh, in a regional or a global sense, uh, sense is going to be in the short run, uh, mainly because of uh, how existing trends of sort of more focus on the nation state and sovereign power have accentuated in, during the pandemic. Uh, having said that, yes, technology does help. My only caveat would be, uh, I think, a lot of these debates need to be had, but they really need to be had during peacetime. They can't be had in the middle of a pandemic. I think if you start engineering solutions and throwing everything you have at a problem in the middle of a pandemic or an emergency of that nature, you might do good things, but you also might do some terrible things uh, trying to do good. So I think like Rahul said, once this is behind us, that will be a good time to take stock of what we've learned. But we really do need to have these debates in a more calm atmosphere when we are not trying to you know, uh, just survive the next 24 hours or the next few days. That's, that's how I would see it. Thanks, Anirudh. But before I turn to Rahul, just on that, I'm just going to push you a little bit if you agree with that. You know, Paul Kennedy wrote a great book called Engineers of Victory. That book was all about how in the midst of the Second World War, in wartime, when survival was in question, you had a bunch of engineers in the UK and other countries that got together and innovated for the future. So I guess the other side of the argument is perhaps crises perhaps provide sometimes the best ecosystem for innovation and for cooperation. And I don't know where you come on that, Raul, but it would be interesting to get your thoughts. Yeah, look, I mean, uh, I, I, first of all, I agree with what Anirudh says. I think, um, particularly in India, we don't even have a privacy law. So we really have no guardrails whatsoever within which uh, to do this. Uh, we need the basic guardrails. Um, and, and so you know, a lot of what, what's gone into, into the Aroge Setu app in terms of the privacy policy, we're not required to put it in there. Uh, we've, we've put it in there because this is global best practices with regard to data minimization, data retention, um, and all of those, those good things. But you're right, uh, uh, Rudy. I think uh, you know it, it's at times like this that um, if you can if you can come up with technology that really helps and do it in a privacy enhancing way, uh, you would never have had the opportunity to think about these issues in sort of quote unquote peacetime. Um, so I think I think my answer to your question is a, is, is somewhere in the middle of what you were saying and what Anirudh is saying. I think it's critical that we have a privacy law and that privacy law needs to spell out the principles, sort of the broad rules of the game. And once we have that, uh, we have the ability uh, in, in these kinds of emergency situations to be able to rustle something up uh, on the fly really quickly uh, that allows us to use technology uh, to you know, do incredible good uh, in the way that we, you know, we would never have been pushed to do if it wasn't for the emergency. But we would be doing that with, uh, within the framework of these principles. We would be doing that within the framework uh, of uh, what privacy allows us to do and what privacy says absolutely you can't do. And in that context, I think we would make um, uh, sort of the best uh, innovations. I think engineering uh, is, uh, is a little easier because you know, you're doing physical things, but when you're talking about uh, technology solutions, you're actually, it's, it's sort of social engineering in a sense. And so I don't think you can be as cavalier with that um, as, as perhaps uh, that example would suggest. Thanks Rahul. And Louis. So I, I absolutely think and agree that technology can be uh, a bridge 
uh, between different countries, between different institutions. We already are seeing, for example, Google and Apple working together, um, which is you know, shocked people that they were working together for pandemic preparedness um, uh, uh, technology. Um, and that they're collaborating with groups at MIT, at Stanford, and talking to countries, et cetera, uh, in a healthy debate on uh, the privacy question, how much data should actually be tracked. So I do think that collaboration also encourages healthy debate. In order, I think, for these sort of applications that are built very custom to countries to be shared to others, and I think that absolutely has to be done. I do encourage strong documentation around what that uh, application does, what the response from the public has been, and disseminate that widely. Singapore has done a very good job in showing this is our application, it's free for download, here's a, a video on what it does. Taiwan's been doing a good job at showing some of their experience with using big data. So trying to communicate and spread those lessons globally, uh, I think is a really important part, but technology can definitely be one of the drivers of that to share, this is application that we built. Here are the laws that we put in place. Here's how we respond to public concern. It's you know, very crucial for countries to be able to share those lessons learned with each other and also with global agencies such as the WHOs of the world, UNICEF, et cetera, so they can build that and consider that into policy for future pandemic pre uh, preparedness. So I, I do think that you know, in a time where it can sometimes be very disheartening with borders closing, with um, people being isolated, et cetera, using technology as a mechanism to try to bridge gaps despite all this, to bring people together despite all this, I think uh, is incredibly encouraging and hopefully will be something that will uh, help us get this under control quickly. And Louis, thank you very much. And just to put my personal preferences, you know, there are also hopes, for instance, that perhaps it's technology in times like this can, can build a truly democratic consensus when it comes to the using of the internet, when it comes to using of technology, and perhaps we can all start learning to give away our IPs and just share more, keeping eminent domain questions in mind. But with that, um, Anui, Raul Martin, Anirudh Berman, thank you so very much for joining us today and for giving us your time in these extraordinary circumstances. Uh, for those who've tuned in, thank you very much from audiences in different parts of the world. There were at least 20 questions that I could not accommodate in this discussion, but I've got some ideas about how we could turn that perhaps into a Q&A series and maybe press on Raul Martin to try and see if he would like to take a stab at it in terms of some of the more detailed questions um, on uh, the Arogya Setu app with regards to India. Our next webinar is on the 28th of this month, that's the 28th of April, on the politics and the future of finance. Please do tune in. And until then, thank you very much and stay safe.